Are you familiar with the key components of the management of HIV positive infants and children? Regular monitoring of CD4 positive T cell counts and HIV RNA viral load, treating HIV with antiretroviral therapy, preventing and treating opportunistic infections, and general supportive care, including emotional support. Your teaching will be vitally important. Education of the parent or caregiver includes good hand washing, the need for regular bathing of the child, the importance of keeping the child's skin clean and dry, especially diaper areas in infants and very young children, the need for moisturizing the skin to prevent cracking and itching, and the importance of keeping bottles clean. This helps prevent fungal infections, which can be very serious in children who have compromised immunity. You'll also educate parents about the signs and symptoms to report and when the child should and shouldn't receive immunizations. For example, MMR is not recommended routinely for severely immunocompromised children. If an HIV-positive child is exposed to measles, the vaccine can be given within 72 hours of exposure or gamma globulin can be given to lessen the effects of the disease. The varicella vaccine is not given to anyone with substantial suppression of cellular immunity. So gamma globulin is a treatment of choice for HIV-infected children exposed to chickenpox. They should be given pneumococcal and influenza vaccines each year, however, since these can be very serious diseases in immunodeficient infants and children. Asymptomatic HIV-positive children can produce antibodies in response to vaccinations, and their antibody titers can be obtained to determine the effectiveness of the vaccines. For antiretroviral therapy, there aren't quite as many choices for children as there are for adults. Currently, there are only five medications approved for pediatric use. Therapeutic strategies focus on early initiation of combination drug therapy to suppress viral replication, to preserve immunologic function, and to prevent the development of drug resistance. When is antiretroviral drug therapy started? Too little information about the absolute numbers related to viral loads in infants and children is available to create concrete guidelines about when to start antiretroviral therapy. It is assumed that in children, as in adults, a high viral load indicates a poor prognosis and a low viral load indicates a better prognosis. It is also known that HIV generally progresses more rapidly in children than it does in adults. One approach is to start all infants under the age of 12 months on antiretroviral agents as soon as HIV infection is confirmed, regardless of immunologic or clinical status. Another is that all symptomatic HIV-positive children be treated. The goal of therapy is similar to that for adults, suppression of viral replication below detectable levels. It can take up to eight weeks to see a response to treatment. In fact, complete suppression to undetectable levels may not be achievable in some children despite aggressive treatment. Another important nursing concern is nutrition because HIV infection often results in nutritional deficiencies and growth failure. Aggressive nutritional support is essential to improve the child's immune status, prevent wasting, decrease morbidity, and improve quality of life. As with everything else, prevention is so much better than intervention. What type of diet do you think is best for an HIV-positive child? A variety of foods, especially those the child enjoys, to encourage eating. The diet should be rich in antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals, and prepared to conserve nutrient content. Many HIV-positive children are from disadvantaged families, so obtaining nutritious foods could be a problem. This is where good nursing care comes in. Families may need help with applying for food assistance programs, budgeting for food, and planning and preparing meals. Children who lose substantial amounts of weight or who suffer from intractable diarrhea need enteral or parental nutrition, and that presents a whole new set of possible problems, such as the family's inability to administer TPN and thus their need for home health care. Many parents of HIV-infected children are very poor or drug-dependent, thus they may not have the ability or resources to handle the stress or the financial burden of caring for a sick child. The parent may feel guilt or anger, leading to further disruption of the family system. It's important to understand how families with HIV-positive children might feel. They are not only dealing with a potentially sick, if not already sick child, but may also be dealing with drug addiction, poverty, substandard housing, inadequate support networks, and poor access to community resources, including medical care. Consequently, HIV-infected children and their families need help from nurses, physicians, social workers, psychologists, dietitians, teachers, clergy, and various therapists. 
The silver lining is that all of these people have an opportunity to work together to improve the child's quality of life, if not the quantity. That's where you would focus your efforts, on quality of life. What about symptom management for children who have AIDS? Opportunistic infections are similar in children and adults, except that the consequence, such as weight loss and electrolyte imbalance, can be faster and more dangerous for children. Children experience headaches, mouth and throat pain, chest pain, muscle aches, peripheral neuritis, and arthralgia, depending on the infection they have, so it's important to assess and treat pain in children consistently. Children may express pain by inactivity or withdrawal, and it is often undertreated in children. You must assess and treat pain in children whether or not its cause can be determined. NSAIDs are often useful for mild pain. Codeine can be added for moderate pain, and severe pain should be treated with a strong opioid such as morphine sulfate. You'd also medicate these children for pain prior to painful procedures. Pain shouldn't be ignored just because children cannot verbalize or accurately describe their pain. Nausea can also be a problem for children who have AIDS. Preventative measures include avoiding spicy and greasy foods, withholding medications that may cause nausea for a half hour before and after meals, and administering anti-emetic medications around the clock rather than PRN. Diarrhea is another problem commonly caused by opportunistic infections. The underlying cause of the diarrhea should be treated if known. Chronic diarrhea can be managed by making changes in the diet, such as eliminating lactose, or by administering anti-motility medications. Severe diarrhea may have to be treated by administering fluids in the hospital to prevent dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Skin care is vital, since diarrhea can produce irritation and skin breakdown very quickly. Another problem is fever. It's very common in children who have AIDS and it can make them very uncomfortable. Antipyretics such as ibuprofen or acetaminophen can be given as needed. Chilling should be avoided by use of a sheet or light blanket since shivering can actually increase body temperature. So, if you are assigned a child who has AIDS and is experiencing respiratory difficulties due to infections, what would you monitor for? Dyspnea, reflected in substernal retraction, tachypnea, wheezing, cough, chest pain, and fatigue. Oxygen saturation is very helpful since children with respiratory infections can develop hypoxia. What supportive measures would the child need? Oxygen, bronchodilators, steroids, antitussive agents, chest physiotherapy, and possibly mechanical ventilation if the respiratory distress is severe. Caring for children who have AIDS isn't that much different from caring for children who have other types of chronic illness. Just keep in mind they have so few defenses to fight off infection. And because AIDS is a terminal illness, some children with AIDS are quite ill and near death. What should you keep in mind for these children? Since most are treated at home, unless they are very ill, you'd help the child and family move through this period with the least discomfort and the most dignity. Everyone involved in the child's care must communicate openly with each other and the family so that they can make informed decisions about the child's care. The parents must understand that there are no options for restoring the child's health at this point, but that you will do everything possible to keep the child comfortable and pain-free.